miscalculations, misperceptions, tension, manage, manage the tensions in a responsible way. Given the situation that we saw unfold this weekend in Russia, is it, are, are you reaching out to your Chinese counterparts through all these different discussion channels to ask them particularly to, to take any particular action in the context of the divisions? In I, Russia? I don't have anything specific to read out to you on that. Sebastian? Thank you very much. Do you have anything on the slightly mysterious conference that took place in Denmark on Saturday? I mean, I say a little mysterious because it was a it was a big conference. It was countries from all over the world, um, including some of the Ukraine skeptic ones, if you can call them that, like India. Um, but very little has come out of it. Um, do you have anything on what did come out of it, and, and could it lead to something uh, more concrete and visible? So you're referring to um, a meeting that happened. It was organized by Ukraine in Copenhagen over the weekend. Um, and on Saturday morning, um, uh, uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan participated in that meeting virtually, and a sen senior director for Europe, Amanda Sloat, part participated in that meeting in person. Again, it was convened by Ukraine. Um, they had a positive and productive discussion about, um, you know, that about what principles for peace could look look like and how we could achieve a just and durable peace in Ukraine. Um, and the attendees broadly agreed that we want to see this world, you know, this war end swiftly, uh, and we want to uh, ensure that everybody uh, continues to respect the fundamental principles of the UN Charter, um, and that includes the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity. Beyond that, I don't have anything to read out to you. Um, this was a meeting convened by Ukraine, and uh, would refer to you, uh, refer you to them for other participants and details. Eric? Thank you, Olivia. Uh, I have two questions for you. I would like to follow up on Andrea's question. Uh, there are alarm bells are ringing in Poland and uh, Baltic states uh, because of the movement of uh, Wagner Group troops to Belarus. And Polish president just today called it a relocation of Russian forces. So is it at all possible that the whole mutiny was just a cover for moving Wagner's troop to Belarus, and what's your reaction to those concerns in uh, on the eastern flank of NATO? So I'm not going to get into any sort of speculation uh, about this situation. We're continuing to monitor it closely, and all I'll say is um, that you know, rhetoric around nuclear weapons is, you know, from the we've seen coming from the Russians is highly irresponsible. Uh, and that said, we've seen no change, no reason to assess that their nuclear posture has changed and no reason to change our own nuclear posture. Um, with that said, uh, we remain, remain committed to the uh, collective defense of the NATO alliance, which of course includes, uh, which of course includes Poland, and um, we are going to stay in close touch with our uh, partners and allies to make sure we continue to monitor, monitor this closely and responsibly. And to follow up on uh, nuclear weapons, uh, President Lukashenko said today that a significant part of the nuclear weapons have been brought to Belarus. Can you confirm that and uh, that in, fa in fact it happened? And uh, if true, why the U.S. is not changing its nuclear posture uh, in response to Russia's? Uh, Russian uh, change in nuclear, uh, their nuclear uh, posture. Um, John yesterday sounded like a little bit dismissive about this uh, uh, this movement. Yeah, I, I, I can't confirm that for you. Mike? Um, you've talked a lot today on back on the economy about what the president has already okay. done in the last two and a half years. That, of course, a lot of the president's agenda was left on the table. Um, child care, ending Trump tax cuts, that kind of thing. At what point, and obviously it's not this speech, but, but at what point does the president have to pivot to be talking about specific proposals for new things that he wants to do in a potential second term or even in the latter part of, of this term? And, 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 and why isn't, uh, you know, if this, I think um, Korean yesterday called it a cornerstone speech or something like that. Why not use this opportunity, you're obviously building up the speech, to do some of that, to talk a little bit about new specific proposals? Well, look, part of what we're doing right now is implementing so much of this legislation, right? I mean, if you, right now, I mean, we launched a couple of weeks ago, uh, invest.gov, where you can go and you can actually see 
where uh, all the private investment that's coming into the United States, um, where all of these 35,000 transportation projects are springing up across, across the country, um, that is now underway. And we're focused on implementing uh, the incredible pieces of historic legislation this president has gotten done over the last two and a half years. Um, and making the case that this is the kind of strategy we need to continue to put the, you know, put the pedal to the metal on, uh, so that we can continue this economic progress and not risk undercutting all of that. Um, because as we've seen, House Republicans continue to try to repeal the IRA and the progress that we're making in investing in clean energy and manufacturing, reshoring jobs in America. Um, they're continuing to push for. Uh, unpaid for extensions of the Trump tax cuts, which would add $3 billion to our deficit, send jobs overseas, uh, and uh, undercut the progress that we've made. So this president is laser focused on you know, the historic progress that we've made, the historic legislation we've made over the last two and a half years, and making sure that we implement that right now successfully so that we can uh, continue to keep our foot on the gas, as they said. But is that, but is that in, does this administration think that's enough, or, or at some point, do, do, does the administration think he has to lay out his his next vision? Well, so today we're focused on tomorrow and laying out Bidenomics and, and talking to the American people about uh, what that is, how it's taken shape, and how it's made a meaningful impact in their lives. Um, that's what we're focused on for the, for the moment. I don't have anything to preview for you in the way of future economic announcements. But um, look, we believe there's really substantial progress to be proud of here. 13 million jobs, 12 million new small business starts, uh, wages that are rising now um, as to where they were um, at the beginning of this, this administration. Their wait, wages are rising now, even when adjusted for inflation. There are a lot of reasons uh, to see positive signs in this economy as a result of what the president has done, and we want to keep that going. Go ahead, Jerry. Thank you. Um, so on that speech tomorrow, is Bidenomics kind of like uh, the message here that as it relates to inflation, as it relates to a lot of the, the, the issues that you guys were dealing with over the last few years, that the worst of it's over? Is that what we're going to hear from President Biden? I am definitely not a, 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 a you know, economic forecaster. I'm not going to get out my crystal ball. I think, as you've heard Lael just lay out really clearly, however, we've seen a lot of positive signs about uh, inflation moderating, um, inflation coming down by 50 percent over the last year, declining for 11 months straight. Uh, certainly, when you look at where other major economies in the world are, the United States has a lower rate of inflation right now than any other major economy. And so that tells us that uh, we are on the right track here, and we've got to continue to keep our foot on the gas. Does the administration share the baseline view of the Federal Reserve that 2 percent inflation is the goal? Uh, I, as you know, cannot comment on the, uh, the independent monetary policy set forward by the Federal Reserve, so I'm just going to leave that there. Ed, go ahead. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, so the Federal Reserve says inflation is double what the Federal Reserve would like to see, and they believe the unemployment rate will go to 4.1 percent. So how is Bidenomics not an era of high inflation and rising unemployment rate? Well, take a look at where we started and where we are now. That's the easiest answer to your question. Uh, when we came into office with the global economic headwinds of, of COVID that were then compounded by um, the disruptions we faced when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine and disrupted global uh, food uh, supply chains, global fuel supply chains, sent inflation soaring around the world. Um, right now, the United States is in a better position on inflation than any other major economy. And why is that? It's because the president uh, took a number of swift and decisive actions to make sure that we got our economy on track, that we got ourselves open and chugging along again. Um, and today, as a consequence of that, we see record low unemployment, record new small business starts, uh, inflation that, again, is lower than any other major economy in the world. Uh, and we're, we're making progress. But we're seeing a layoff, specifically talking about uh, the auto industry. For example, Ford is saying they're laying off workers to afford the cost of the transition to EV. Uh, the first quarter of this year, Ford lost $700 million on their EV program, lost $600 million last year. So is that what we can expect with Bidenomics? Well, I would just say, looking across the economy broadly, uh, we're seeing signs of progress. We're seeing, as I said just a moment ago, record low unemployment, record small business starts, jobs that are coming back by the hundreds of thousands overseas as a result of uh, private investment in clean energy manufacturing uh, in our country. And so um, certainly we believe that broadly we are uh, on the right track here, that Bidenomics is uh, having a, a tremendous impact, and we want to continue to see that progress 
uh, move forward. Go ahead. Uh, does the White House have a response to Ron DeSantis' proposal to use lethal force against drug cartels trying to cut through the uh, border wall along the southern border? Um, I've got to be really careful from here and talking about uh, 2024 declared 2024 presidential candidates as, as a result of something that you all know it's called the Hatch Act prevents me from doing so. Um, but I, what I will say broadly is that with respect to um, with respect to immigration, you know, this president came into office introducing a comprehensive immigration reform, uh, sought and received and was able to uh, obtain record border security funding. Uh, was able to put in set, uh, put in place a set series of policies that expanded legal pathways for migration, um, that dealt with our border situation, and has now resulted in a significant decrease in unlawful border crossings since the lifting of Title 42. And he's done all of that without the help of Republican governors around the country or Republican lawmakers in Congress. And so um, we think that this is a serious issue that demands leadership uh, and that, uh, you know, the president is providing that leadership. And uh, we just hope that, you know, Republicans will find their way to the table. But, but on the policy itself, do you think, putting aside Ron DeSantis's proposal of it, do you consider that the use of lethal force against you know, he says drug cartels. Do you consider that draconian? Going I, I haven't seen the details of this policy, and I'm not going to speak to it specifically. Um, also, given my Hatch Act concerns, but I'm happy to take it and come back to you if I can say anything about it. Jackie, go ahead. What message is the president trying to send um, to the American people when he invites his son to the state dinner and Camp David, as we saw this past weekend, amid everything he's going through? Every president of the United States has invited their family to state dinner. This president also has a family. Uh, he is no different. And um, beyond that, I'm just not going to engage on this. The former White House Press Secretary, Jen Psaki, um, acknowledged that optically that might not have been easier for the White House. Um, can you elaborate on, on that at all, the decision to, to invite the president's son amid everything that he's going through and what challenges that poses uh, for, for this White House to explain? Like every other administration, like every other president, this president has a family, uh, and he did exactly what m many prior administrations have done. And beyond that, I really don't have any comment on this. Go ahead, Catherine. Thanks. Um, you've mentioned a couple times the idea that people are just starting to feel the impact of the president's economic policies. Does the administration have an assessment of how long it will take for these policies to sink in, and will it be before the next election? Uh, well, look, I'm not going to speak to future elections from here, but this president is, um, as I said, uh, we have already seen the strongest and fastest economic recovery of any major economy in the world. So. Uh, We've already seen, um, I just talked about the millions of jobs that have been created, the millions of new small business starts. So we are on, on track. We are making progress. Um, all I'm saying is that uh, the president is really laser focused on uh, making sure that we implement his best in America agenda and continue to, uh, you know, as I said, keep, make sure that we keep accelerating forward. I just want to try once more on the layoffs at Ford. I don't know if you have any comment on the layoffs themselves. and. Is the administration comfortable with the idea that jobs could be lost in this process of transitioning to electric vehicles? Well, look, um, certainly anytime somebody loses a job, loses a paycheck, that's something we're concerned about. Um, the president knows that uh, deeply and personally, um, what that is like for a family. And so certainly anytime we're hearing about uh, layoffs in the economy, we're concerned about that and monitoring that and looking at that. Uh, but what I will say more broadly is part of the reason why the the, um, the uh, clean energy investments that the president has made in our economy are so important is because we are simultaneously um, moving his ambitious climate agenda forward, but also bringing clean energy jobs and manufacturing jobs and supply chains back to the United States by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, so, you know, um, again, anytime we hear that somebody has lost a job and a paycheck, that is something we take very seriously and don't want to... Um, diminish, but uh, we're making progress here, and we think that's important to lift up too. Courtney, thank you. On child care, um, the Commerce Department is requiring certain recipients of CHIPS funding to provide child care to their workers. I know you've been talking about different infrastructure investments today. Lyle was talking about that as well. Um, 
looking at, I know the White House is also looking at other ways to replicate that idea to expand child care when it wasn't put in the Inflation Reduction Act. Can you talk about where you are on that um, in terms of attaching legislation, child care legislation you already have passed? I, I, I'm going to have to take that. I just don't have an update um, for you today on that. Go ahead. Uh, I've got a quick question about the lunch and then a couple follow-ups from last week. About the lunch, uh, President Obama reportedly told President Biden ahead of 2020, quote, you don't have to do this, Joe, you really don't. Uh, can you say if a similar message was shared today? I can't and I don't know what you're referring to. Uh, regarding whether he should continue to serve in public life. I, I, I don't know what you're referring to and I don't have any comment on it. On last week, um, does the White House believe Attorney General Garland committed uh, perjury when he testified under oath that Delaware U.S. Attorney David Weiss could bring charges outside of his district? I don't have any comment on this. Anita, uh, go ahead. In 10 days Stephen, of, uh, I'm moving on. Anita? I have a China question and also um, a Ukraine question. First of all, on China, can you just lay out the expectations for Secretary Yellen's trip? And is this possible executive order on outbound investment on the table? Um, I'll leave it to the Treasury Department to discuss any potential travel that Secretary Yellen has. Great. Then on Ukraine, today's package, I didn't see it mention uh, long-range missiles, which Ukraine has asked for. Uh, they want them to take back territory. Is, are those not on the table? Why are they not there, and are they going to be considered in future packages? Look, our focus has always been on making sure that Ukraine has what it needs to defend itself and defend its territory and its sovereignty. Um, what I would just say to you on your specific question is, um, you know, you should feel free to reach out to the Department, Department of Defense about all of the specific contents of this package. I think they may have some more detail to lay out. Yeah, Follow on your question. Yeah, right yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, I just wanted to get a comment on the Supreme Court decision today on Moore versus Harper. Sure. Um, so uh, this morning at the Supreme Court, uh, there was a critical decision with respect to voting rights. Um, as you know, this has been an enormous priority for the president and the vice president uh, since the day that they entered office um, uh, to strengthen and shore up voting rights in this country. And so we're pleased that the Supreme Court uh, rejected the extreme legal theory uh, presented in this case, which would have interfered with state governments, uh, which would have opened the door for politicians to undermine the will of the people, and would have threatened the freedom of all Americans to have their voices heard at the ballot box. Um, again, as you just heard me say, the president and the vice president have made this a significant priority since they first entered office, uh, and they will continue to fight to make sure that, um, to fight to urge Congress to pass uh, critical voting rights legislation in Congress to, as we go forward to ensure there are fair congressional maps and that people have access to the ballot box. Follow up on inflation real quickly, please. Uh, so you mentioned that the White House believes inflation is moderating. Uh, the Bank of America CEO, Brian Monahan, said in an interview today that we think it'll take Fed officials all of this year and all of next year into 2025 before they get inflation in line with their long-term target. Does the White House agree with this assessment? I certainly am not going to make any predictions from here, an economic forecast from here. All I can say is what Lil said a few moments ago. Um, uh, which is that we've seen inflation come down significantly over the past year, 50 percent over the last year, 11 months straight. Um, and, you know, we're going to continue to do everything in our power to keep lowering costs for the American people and continue uh, making all that progress. Yeah. Following up on the president's call with President Zelensky, he had said that there would be a second one. So it sounds like that hasn't happened yet, though. Do you expect that to happen today? I don't have any call to read out to you. Okay. And then in the call that they did have, did the president encourage President Zelensky to attend the NATO summit next month in Lithuania? And does President Biden expect to meet with President Zelensky in person at that summit? I don't have any news to share with you on that front. Certainly, this is going to be a really important NATO summit with a lot on the table, an opportunity for uh, the president and other NATO allies to gather and talk about so many things, including Ukraine. Um, you know, as we've said many times, you know, one thing that is quite remarkable today is how uh, NATO is stronger, it's larger, it's more purposeful than ever before. Of course, uh, we're looking forward to welcoming uh, our newest member in the NATO Alliance, Finland, in a couple of weeks. Um, and certainly this is going to be an important summit on a number of fronts, but I don't have anything respect respective to a particular bilateral meeting to read out to you today. Uh, let's just do one, we have one more. 
Okay, go right here. Thank you. Um, the Russian uh, defense minister is in Cuba today. He's meeting there with his counterpart, and they both agreed to strengthen the relationship, invest in more military projects. Is the White House uh, watching this? Do you have anything on this? Uh, this is not something. I, I, I need to take this one back and see what my NSC colleagues might have to say about it. All right. Thanks, all. Have a great afternoon, and I'll see some of you in Chicago tomorrow.